coming up tonight on News 7. Two Linenville stores have been robbed early this morning. Plus, what will Sheffield be talking about come town meeting day? The snow has finally returned, but how long is it going to be sticking around for? I'll have all that in my full weather forecast coming up because News 7 starts right now. Live from the Vermont Center for Community Journalism, this is News 7 at 5.30. Good evening, I'm Jessica Walsh. And I'm Joseph Peters. State police officers are on the lookout after an alleged burglary occurred in Lindenville. That's right, Joe. Early this morning, an unknown number of people forced their way into Ville Auto Supply and Bagel Depot. They went around the back of both shops, making their way from the ground below to the roof above. They then broke a large part of the roof's vent. After that, the burglar or burglars broke a hole in the ceiling and went behind the shop counter to steal around $50. They then proceeded to go into the shop's cold storage room. That's where the suspect or suspects broke another hole in the crawl space between Ville Auto and Bagel Depot. After getting through the Bagel Depot side, they stole just under $400 from the cash register. As far as the monetary, I mean, it's it was our startup money for in the morning. It's not, I mean, it doesn't, it's, you know, more of an inconvenience and, and an intrusion. The investigating officers were not available for comment. However, both shop owners, Mark Valoy of Ville Auto and Chip Osaker of Bagel Depot, say that they were unaware if one person or multiple people broke in. They were also not told anything about the gender of the alleged burglar or burglars. If anybody has any information regarding these burglaries, they are asked to call the state police at 802-748-3111. 15% of Vermont's children live in poverty. Just over 6% of Vermonters are unemployed. Those numbers are better than the national average, but one group says they simply aren't good enough. Joining us on set is Bruce Listman, a retired Wall Street executive who now runs the Campaign for Vermont. Mr. Listman, thanks for joining us. What, thanks for having me. Absolutely. What is the Campaign for Vermont? Well, it's an advocacy group. Uh, we're nonpartisan. We're uh, certainly nonprofit. We're not connected to any political party or or those who would run for political office, rather were uh, trying to build a coalition uh, in support of some really good common sense ideas. Our central theme is that uh, the best time to think about building a diversified, dynamic economy is yesterday. The second best time to do it is today. It's good for jobs, it's good for the people in Vermont. It's a, an important long-term consideration. And so we're advocating for good ideas mainstream ideas, ideas that are moderate in just about every sense uh, that would underpin uh, the idea of building a very strong economy. Thank you. Well, your background is on Wall Street, so what led you to actually form this organization? Well, that's true. I was on Wall Street a long time. I grew up in Burlington. I went to Burlington schools. Uh, I went to uh, the University of Vermont. My parents uh, lived there. My mother uh, worked as, a, as an assistant at the university to, uh, so that my brother and I could get an, an employee discount. And uh, uh, we both uh, sort of migrated to New York, and, and uh, I certainly really felt like I never left uh, this uh, Vermont community and was back often, and on top of that, served on some boards in, in Burlington. Uh, uh, upon uh, 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 coming back, I took a tour and met just an awful lot of people, including in, in just in this town as well. And I think I saw in a very clear way an opportunity uh, for our state to build itself, uh, you know, an economy of its own making, but one that uh, creates more jobs and there are people to fill them. And through that, begin a process of restocking what I think are natural resource. Biggest one we have, of course, are our people. People who graduate from college or graduate from high school who will be going out to college and will be hopefully a magnet for uh, families that live outside of Vermont who want to be here for our school system, uh, for the uh, quality of life, and because there's a terrific job. Excellent. Now, in about an hour, you'll be hosting a forum in St. Johnsbury, and several local business leaders will be in attendance. What do you hope to gain from that forum? It's an opportunity for, for me to learn a lot, I hope. Uh, for people who are interested, uh, there are uh, going to be uh, four people there from the community talking about things that they do. For example, uh, Tim McGuire's uh, Burke Mountain, John Goodrich, an old friend of mine, is at uh, Weedman and 
Paul Bengston, uh, Northeastern Vermont Regional Hospital, and Tracy Holbrook is of, of, of Union Bank. They're people who have uh, deep roots in this community, but also a broader perspective. It's an opportunity for those who come to say, I have a couple of things on my mind about our state or the economy, and I have some ideas. And I don't know about you, but I get my best ideas uh, not from uh, staring out the window, but from talking with others, other people who have thoughtful uh, ideas and prepared to offer them. Excellent. Well, thank you very much for your time, Mr. Lisman. Thanks we so much that. for having me. Absolutely. Now, News 7 will be at tonight's forum, as will several local business people. Our own Brad Hickok spoke to a few of them earlier this afternoon. The campaign for Vermont makes its third stop on their tour of the state tonight at the Canamount Arts in St. Johnsbury. Their mission focuses mainly on ways to help stimulate what has become a stagnant economy oh, yeah, through right. the implementation of new or revised principles. I think there's a strong need for these principles to be brought to Vermont and brought to bear on how we're conducting our business as a state. The campaign is making a series of town visits in order to promote a stronger economy for Vermont through supporting local businesses. I just think the, the job creation itself, when we're, we're adding um, businesses and you know in our case hotels and amenities uh, to the area there's all sorts of jobs you need from management jobs to accounting to all all types of jobs that need more than a uh, than a high school education they need an advanced degree so tonight's 90-minute public forum is designed to discuss ways to help develop revenue and create jobs in the state by supporting grassroots movements we've been involved in many grassroots uh, uh, efforts here because uh, again, um, we, we haven't sat around waiting for somebody else to come and do something for us. We, we actually invest uh, hundreds of thousands of dollars a year in educating people in this area to fill positions here at the hospital. The forum will feature four panel members, including Weidman Incorporated Vice President John Goodrich, Northern Vermont Regional Hospital CEO Paul Bengston, Burke Mountain Vice President and General Manager Tim McGuire, and Union Bank Regional Vice President Tracy Holbrook. That forum will be this evening at 6.30 at the Catamount Arts. This is the third stop on the tour, and they plan on making quite a few more. Representative Peter Welch is trying to ease the financial burden for Vermont high schoolers and their families. Welch is working hand in hand with the Vermont Student Assistance Corporation to navigate through the student financial aid process. High school seniors all over Vermont, specifically at St. Johnsbury Academy, are awaiting the arrival of college acceptance letters. This means that VSAC counselors are helping these students and their families begin the difficult financial aid process. Many Vermont students depend on financial aid to go to college, and the guidance staff at the Academy recognizes this. Nobody wants to pay as much for college as they do. It's, it's a financial hardship to send your kids to college, and we understand that. And, um, any help that the government could come up with or the state could come up with would be, would be incredibly beneficial. Um, we hate to see talented students uh, feel they can't get a four-year degree because of finances. Vermont is one of the only states that offers guidance counselors specifically for financial aid. These counselors help those students from day one to graduation day. After 15 years in business, one store is closing down and then reopening. News 7's Alyssa Ellis took a look at what prompted this decision. With two other stores, PNS Furniture and Concord is closing down and will later reopen as a used furniture store. The numbers, it's just the numbers are not good with the two stores this close together. We decided we needed a change. In the past, the store in Concord was mostly a used store, but had new items as well. Um, we're kind of going back to that. That was successful, and we still have lots of people coming here looking for the used furniture, so we think it's going to be an easy transaction. Owner Paul Demers said that he thinks that it will take at least three months to get the store empty. Well, hopefully we will sell it all. Um, we'll keep dropping the prices until it's gone. With the tax-free store in Littleton, Demers sees a drop in the amount of customers going to the Concord store to purchase new furniture. That's why we opened over there. We kind of had to because we could see everybody in the Littleton, not in Littleton, in the St. Johnsbury and Lindenville area are shopping over there. And that's why we opened because we could see that we had to. And, and that's it. Instead of 
people shopping here at PS Furniture, they're going to go to Littleton and shop PS Furniture, and that's what's going on. The stores in Littleton and Barrie will remain open and unchanged. Alyssa Ellis, News 7, Concord. All three stores are currently accepting used furniture trade-ins. That used furniture will be used to help stock the Concord store once it's reopened. And now Torrance Gosher joins us with a first look at the forecast. Torrance, on my way to work today, I noticed several cars spun off the road due to poor driving conditions. Is that going to get better or worse in the next 24 hours? Well, Joe, unfortunately, um, we are seeing some snow out there right now. Not heavy snow, but enough to make the road slick. Currently, it's 22 degrees outside the station. Our dew, paint, our dew point is at 20 degrees as well. Taking a live look at that radar, you can see there's not much out there. That's because the radar beam is being blocked by the Green Mountains. But taking a broader look out there, you can see some snow working their way. Now work its way in later on tonight and into tomorrow. So overnight tonight, we're going to see some light snow falling anywhere between an inch to three inches in the higher elevations with a low about 22 degrees. Tomorrow, getting up to about 25 degrees, we've got some snow showers going to be working their way out there as well. My headline's coming up. We're going to talk about the snow coming in tonight. We're seeing a little bit of cooler temperatures over the next couple days, but there will be a warm-up on the way. Back to you, Joe. Coming up tonight on News 7. Pond skimming is this weekend in Burke. Get a first look as they construct their pond. Plus, St. John's Berry Academy won the Vermont Department of Health School Wellness Award. And we'll tell you how some schools are taking extra safety precautions. News 7 starts right now. Live from the Vermont Center for Community Journalism, this is News 7 at 5.30. Good evening, I'm Joseph Peters. And I'm Jen Morin. The Vermont Senate is delaying action on a bill allowing immigrant farm workers to become Vermont drivers. The Transportation Committee approved the bill last week 4-1. to one. The Senate was expected to debate the, de the measure this week. However, the bill was not debated in the Senate because it contains a fee. That fee would force an immigrant to pay to get the special driving privilege card. As a result, the bill is on its way to the Finance Committee for further review. If the bill passes, immigrants who are in the country illegally would be able to get their driving privilege card so long as they pass the usual lear learner's permit and driving tests. What do Facebook, Bell Bikes and East Burke have in common? More than you might think. News 7's Jack Carney has more. Bell Bikes is using Facebook so people can vote in awarding $100,000 to three trail projects across the nation. A pump track, a flow trail, and a downhill trail. Kingdom Trails of East Burke is hoping its flow trail will get the most votes, or rather, most clicks. So I wrote a, I wrote a grant, um, submitted it. Um, and we were chosen as, as one of the 12 finalists out of over um, 100 plus that were submitted. Uh, we were one of the top 12. Um, so right now we're competing, like I said, with three other projects um, to, to win this funding. And so, I mean, all these projects are great. They're all worthy. Um, we're just really trying to get the word out um, to have a, a beginner level flow trail built up on the Burke Bike Park. Currently, Kingdom Trails has a 1% lead in the vote. And Scott says that grant money will help bring the project to life quicker. You know, and coming up with the funding to, to make these trails happen, uh, you know, can be, can be pretty daunting because you know, it's, it, it's, it's not cheap. Um, takes time, money, um, you know, a, a lot of knowledge and skill on how to build it. Scott says the money won't just help at Kingdom Trails. As the snow falls outside the trail station, across the street, inside East Burke Sports, John Unsworth is staying warm building new rental bikes for the upcoming season this May. Yeah, um, all our bikes that we rent go up to the bike park. I mean, on any given weekend, we have 70 bikes go out probably. Um, yeah, the grant will definitely keep us busier. Now, if Kingdom Trails does win the contest, the grant and all the money in it will go directly to them. However, more bikes at Kingdom Trails could mean bigger and better business for the downtown behind me. Jack Carney, News 7. East Burke. Voting in the contest ends on April 12th and the link to the voting can be found on our website news7newslink.net. Governor Shumlin joined the State Board of Education yesterday congratulating the newly elected board chair, two co-vice chairs and the rest of the newly appointed board members. Stephen Morse was re-elected as chair of the State Board of Education. This is Morse's second year as chair 
Moore, Moore said, quote, I look forward to working with all of our educational partners to make the Vermont education system even better, end quote. Sean Marie Oler was elected as co-vice chair as well as Lachlan Francis. The State Board of Education meets monthly and the discussions focus on policies concerning the education of Vermont students and assuring equal access to a quality education. The Sandy Hook Elementary shootings have prompted some schools, faculty and staff to reevaluate what they can do to keep their students safe. News 7's Erica Pont has more. With an increase in violence all over the country, schools are taking safety measures created in the past and making them better. So we are following a lot of what was set out by the Vermont crisis team back in 2008 and I think, I, I believe uh, because of what happened, they're starting to revamp some of the work that they did at that time. There are new additions to the school crisis guide that just came into place this year. After the shooting, Woodsville High, among many in the area, took extra precaution in keeping their students safe. We took all of our faculty, split them into three groups, and gave them a tour of all three buildings to take a look at nooks and crannies and evacuation places that other people might not think of. The cost is a factor to why some schools haven't made physical changes yet. We haven't done a lot of retrofitting and changing yet. It's all in the uh, planning stages because most of it costs some serious money and we just don't have it. The St. Johnsbury School Board members along with the St. Johnsbury Police Department are open to the possibility of having an officer at the school. While getting the police involved in the efforts may take some time, the school is also considering other possibilities. Uh, we, are, we are going to begin a system where we have a few people who have emergency buttons. They're kind of like lifeline buttons where they are just carrying something. If they press it, it calls the police immediately so you don't even have to get to a phone. People in Bradford voted against placing a resource officer in Oxbow High School. Littleton High had a resource officer up until a few years ago, but have not discussed reinstating one. Linden Institute declined an interview due to privacy reasons, and St. Johnsbury Academy issued us this statement. One thing that all school representatives have in common is that they don't believe their schools are unsafe. They just want to make them safer. Erica Ponce, News 7, Linden. If you'd like to learn more about the Vermont Crisis Team plans and regulations, you can visit Vermont.gov and search Crisis Team. The New Hampshire state budget is one step closer to being finalized. Members of the House passed a two-year $11 billion budget. They are also debating a bill that would make necessary law changes to, the implement, to implement the budget. This, pr this proposal is expected to be about $52 million less than Governor Maggie Hassan's proposed budget. The St. Johnsbury School found out yesterday that they had won the Most Improved Vermont Department of Health School Wellness Award. With this award comes a $5,000 cash reward. Recently, the school introduced a fitness gram, which every student now uses to document their physical activities and healthy eating. One of these physical education elements is an after-school swimming program, which currently includes around 100 participants. All of these students are from the first through fifth grade, with two groups just for fifth and sixth graders. School nurse Stephanie Rowe says that interest in this and other programs has increased and that she expects it to continue doing so. Thus far this year we've had about 143, 150 students participating, but we anticipate that overall 300 will have participated by the end of the year. I think it's been really exciting for a lot of the kids, some of whom have never seen the pool. So it's, it's a pretty exciting event for them to be able to do this. Rose says that this grant cannot be used to subsidize their current program and that the school will meet together to decide how to use it. Tomorrow night at 7 p.m., the Linden Developmental Review Board will consider, consider finalizing a proposal that would allow the pizza man to serve alcohol outdoors. The Pizza Man would become the first restaurant in Lindenville currently allowed to serve outdoors, conditional on approval of the de Developmental Review Board. The restaurant received approval from the Select Board last week for an outdoor consumption permit. The Select Board is requiring that the outdoor seating follow the same rules as a bar, even though it's a restaurant. It will have to be well lit and abide by limitations for noise, littering, and loitering. The seating will also be fenced off and only accessible from inside the restaurant. Owner Shane Switzer says his customers gave him the idea. We already have an out, outdoor seating area for our ice cream and um, so 
nice day. People ask me all the time last summer, can I bring this beverage outside? And, um, and you can't. As soon as Switzer gets approval from the Developmental Review Board, he will begin construction on the outdoor seating. He hopes to have it open by the end of April. And now James Cinco joins us with the first look at our forecast. James, I, I saw that sun out there today, but it was windy and cold. When are we going to see spring-like temperatures? Well, Jen, they're only 24 hours away. We had quite a bit of cold weather, and you can see outside right now, 33 degrees. It is pretty chilly for this time of year. We average about 45, and those winds were howling today. They've started to back off a little bit. Easterly winds now at 12 miles per hour, but the barometric pressure is on the rise, and an area of high pressure is on its way. So looking at our weather makers right now, we have clouds to the north clouds to the south and west and we have two systems going on. We have a backdoor system that's trying to sneak its way in here and we'll see that for tonight. Just a little bit more of some winter, some snow showers tonight and we'll see those break up for tomorrow. This large area of dry weather back here across the northern part of the Great Lakes, this will move into our area so we will begin to see much better forecasts. 18 degrees tonight, those isolated snow showers. Generally no accumulations anywhere you go unless you go really high like I'm talking talk about Burt Fountain will probably see some snow. 47 for tomorrow with mostly sunny skies. And your headlines look like this. We're talking colder temperatures just for tonight. Warming trend on the way. And we are tracking a major winter storm. I'll have all of this and more coming up right after soon. Doc, back to you guys at the desk. News out of Lindenville. A fire has completely engulfed a house. The family may have lost everything. New seven stars right now. Live from the Vermont Center for Community Journalism, this is News 7 at 5.30. Good evening, I'm Joseph Peters. And I'm Phil Alexander. That fire we mentioned is on Speedwell Street in Linden, and while it's under control now, firefighters found themselves breaking through windows to extinguish the flames inside. The homeowners weren't at the residence when the fire started, and they're not sure what may have caused the blaze. Witnesses on scene that there was, say that there was a pile of wood on fire and that the fire spread to the house. We have reporters on scene right now. Firefighters weren't able to comment at this time, and the homeowners weren't comfortable speaking on camera. We will have updates as this story continues to develop. A fire at Vermont's Ethan Allen plant in Orleans last night forced the plant's closure today. Orleans' assistant fire chief Scott Burdick said that an issue with a motor sparked a blaze in two sawdust silos, a blaze which burned into the morning hours. No injuries were reported, but about 400 employees had the day off today as a result of the fire. And on a related note, fire officials in both New Hampshire and Vermont are warning residents about fire season. There are typically two fire seasons in a New England year. A short one in the fall as the leaves dry out before winter, and a longer one in the springtime when dead leaves and brush warm up quickly and are easily set ablaze. Burning permits in both states are limited during this time of year as a result of the dry weather and the increased risk for brush fires. And the fire danger is expected to remain high, as there is little chance of precipitation this week. Still, there are plenty of ways that Northeast Kingdom residents can protect themselves from the dangers of brush fires. Brad Hickox has more on this beautiful but potentially dangerous time of the year. April and May are one of the most common times for fires to occur in Vermont, accounting for over 2,000 fires between 1980 and 2012. Fairbanks Museum and Magic 97.7 meteorologist Lawrence Hayes put that in perspective for us. 75% of wildfires that occur in Vermont occurred during the months of April and May. Burning debris is the number one cause of fire in Vermont, accounting for over 40% of these fires. Conditions that contribute to increased fire danger include warm temperatures, high or gusty winds above 25 miles per hour, dry weather, low humidity, and plenty of sunshine. There are five fire danger ratings which range from low to extreme based on these five criteria. People need to know, especially with the weather today and what's expected tomorrow, the drying, uh, the grass and what are, are, are going to be easily ignited. So they just got to be aware of that and be very careful. Today's weather conditions included four of these five requisites. If it hasn't rained lately and if the, you know, the grass hasn't greened up yet, there's not a lot of leaves on the trees yet, that usually means that you could be at risk of having your fire get out of control. According to Hayes, a little bit more wind and we could have seen more fires around the Northeast Kingdom. Both structure fires and grass fires are occurring, and even with different sources, the conditions are right for them to last. 
With lots of sunshine and rising temperatures, this threat is only going to continue. Brad Hickox, News 7, St. Johnsbury. Fire officials with the Department of Forest, Parks and Recreation are urging people to be aware of this danger and take steps to prevent wildland fires from starting in the first place. People should call 911 immediately if a fire gets out of, Rachel, out of control. And Rachel Kelly will have more on this fire danger later in the broadcast. It's been over two weeks since the initial Boston bombings occurred, but more progress has been made on this incident. Police have taken three additional suspects into custody, two of which were classmates of bombing suspect Zokar, Zokar Zarneyev. Azmat Tajiakov and Dias Kardabeyev, who were Zarneyev's roommates, and Rodabel Filipos, a U.S. citizen, have been detained due to events after the attacks. The two roommates were actually already in custody on immigration charges. They are also being accused of helping Zarneyev dispose of the evidence after the Boston bombing. It doesn't appear that they were involved with the plot itself. Rather, investigators are charging the two roommates with obstruction of justice and making false statements. While Filippos was charged with lying to federal agents that were probing to the bombing. All three were scheduled to make a federal court appearance at 3.30 this afternoon. We will keep you informed with any new information we receive throughout the broadcast. And today is the day that gas tax in Vermont is officially going up by 5.9 cents per gallon. This increase infects many, both gas station owners and customers. Pumping gas might cost a pretty penny. With a tax increase of almost six cents per gallon, it will likely be more difficult for Vermonters to keep pumping in their home state. You know, if we have to get gas, you know, before you head out, but if you're down in New Hampshire, you're gonna, people are going to gas up, and we'll probably gas up on the way back. Gas stations are also hit hard by the tax. So that, that six cents is, is big. It really is. I mean, we don't even operate on a six cent profit, net profit. That's our profit. And now there isn't as much profit to be had, with motorists stopping by less because of increasing costs to get your gas pumped. Well, with economic times tight, you know, and, and now it's $50, $60 to fill up your tank, you know, a penny here, a penny there. Even then, Vermont motorists are left without much choice. They can cut back on the number of times they visit the pumps, but they still have to get gas, just not as much. It's not uh, that inconvenient, but I mean, it's, you know, as I say, we try to conserve as much as you can, you have to. And it's just another thing you got to conserve on. You know, it's only, you know, 60, 80 cents a tank more, but still, that's adds up after a while. I would, you know, ain't much you're gonna do about it either. You know, you just gotta do it if you want to ride. A diesel tax is also set to take place. That tax will be two cents per gallon and is set to come into effect on July 1st. Money raised from the gas and diesel tax will go toward the $56 million needed to repair roads and bridges. Members of the Vermont House are expected to give final approval to their version of the end-of-life bill. Their version is expected to clash with what state senators proposed. Differences include how involved the state should be in monitoring the death process. The House version requires that the patients make mentally competent requests three times, with at least one of those requests being in writing. And the Senate version takes away criminal liability for health professionals if the patient takes a lethal dose of medication. There were two major developments yesterday in the political war being waged in Montpelier over wind power. First, the government's Energy Siting Commission related, released their final report. Their recommendations included an increased emphasis on energy planning at all levels, including local and state government. And the commissioning calls for more transparency and public input when it comes to the permitting process. Now, it's important to know that the commission's recommendations are not binding, and it's unclear whether or not any of them will be adopted today. The Senate's version of the budget is up for a vote, and yesterday, Senator Jane Kitchell, the chair of the Senate Appropriations Committee, put that language into the budget that would force the state to adopt many of the Commission's recommendations. The amendment requires the Public Service Board to, quote, strengthen the role of local and regional plans in the siting review process. 
The amendment would also require the Department of Public Service to post meeting times and pertinent documents on its website. That information would have to be posted on a, quote, prominent page. Speaking of prominent pages, you can find all the latest details about energy siting legislation on our website, news7newslink.net. For the fifth year in a row, hundreds of people gathered on the State House lawn for what is nationally known as May Day. Here at News 7's Erica Pont takes us there. Plus loads of people from different organizations from all over the state set up booths, held up signs, and marched the streets to get their voices heard. About it is that this is bringing dissimilar groups from all over the state together. So we have organizing committees in the Northeast Kingdom and every county in the state. Vermonters came to share their opinions on topics such as immigrant rights, wind farms, education costs, and health care. The Vermont Workers' Center coordinates the Put People First campaign that spearheaded the rally. One bill that they're focusing on is known as Bill S-59. This bill's going to allow us the right to form a union if we'd like, and in this union we'll be able to have a voice on what our needs are so that we can have stability within our jobs and be able to provide better care to those we give services to. And today we're actually talking to people that uh, will be affected by those cuts and gathering their stories about what those cuts will mean to them personally. So um, we're really trying to um, use our democratic right to really speak out. The Northeast Kingdom 99% organization also attended today. One member, Mary Alice Brenner, says she's had enough. I'm tired of reactive and marching and petitioning and demonstrating. I'm ready for war. Brenner says they've participated in such events since the 60s and she's eager for change. Along with the rally, free health screenings were offered along with complimentary food and activities for kids. Um, I'm really excited about today. It brings a lot of hope to us that there could be great changes. The hope for today's peaceful today. protest was to inform today, those who are unaware of current issues in the state and for like-minded people to come together. Erica Pont, News 7, Montpelier. Put People First is a growing initiative of organizations dedicated to creating a Vermont that fulfills human rights. You can visit workerscenter.org backslash people's budget if you'd like to learn more. The town of St. Johnsbury is still trying to find a direction to take with the ongoing Safe Routes to School project. The project was originally designed in 2007 and includes installing new crosswalks, sidewalks, and signs around the street, signs around the St. Johnsbury School and Western Avenue area. However, town officials are currently focusing on the multi-million dollar water and sewer infrastructure project that could potentially ruin any construction of the Safe Routes project. The Safe Routes project is being funded by an $85,000 federal grant, but and, but and now the town is concerned about losing that money. I think it boils back to how comfortable are they going to be that the state of Vermont will indeed still have money for them next year. Uh, if that if that is an issue, we'll, we may have to look at some different things we can do. But. Hall and Select Board Chair Kevin Audie will be attending Monday's, Monday night school board meeting where they hope progress is made on the status of the project. And now Rachel Kelly joins us for our first look at our forecast. Coming up tonight on News 7. We have the latest in a ongoing search at the Comerford Dam. Plus a car fire in St. Johnsbury. And find out what is going on at the Miller's Run School. News 7 starts right now. Live from the Vermont Center for Community Journalism, this is News 7 at 5.30. Good evening, I'm Kevin Lassard. And I'm Jessica Walsh. Right now we're working on a developing story out of uh, in Barnet out of the Comerford Dam. We're going to show you some live footage here in a second. It's been confirmed by police and other local authorities that a 23-year-old male was reported missing after a canoe flipped over just before 2 p.m. today. Two people that he was with have made it out of the water. One was taken away by an ambulance and the other one was not injured. The Red Cross as well as a dive team will be arriving on scene at about 6 p.m. and are going to prepare to the search throughout the night. The Caledonia Sheriff's Department, Vermont State Police, Monroe Fire and Barnet Fire among others are all on the scene and are hoping that the person is hanging onto the canoe which was just spotted around 4.30. All immediate family have been notified. 
St. Johnsbury Fire and Rescue responded to a car fire today around 1 p.m. in Danville. The fire was ignited by a faulty catalytic converter, which keeps engines from overheating. The incident happened on North Danville Road, just off of Route 2. The car was significantly damaged from the fire, but there were no reported injuries from the incident. St. Johnsbury Fire Chief Troy Ruggles said that this sort of occurrence is not uncommon. Today, residents of Wheelock and Sheffield are making their way to Miller's Run School and the Wheelock Town Clerk's Office. Around 10 o'clock this morning, people started to trickle into the Wheelock Town Hall and Miller's Run to vote through Australian ballot after the school budget that didn't pass at town meeting day. Over $100,000 was taken off the school budget. The majority of that money was taken off the budget from the repairment of the Miller's Run School roof. Rather than redoing the entire roof, the school decided to only fix part that was leaking. Wheelock resident Lorraine Poulin said she voted and shared why voting is so important. Civic duty. You need to get out there and vote either one way or the other because if they don't, they don't, the school board doesn't have any guidelines to go. And part of the problem is the school board really doesn't have a lot of wiggle room. Continue throughout the rest of the day until 7 p.m. and the ballots will be counted tonight. We will have the results for you right back here tomorrow. The St. Johnsbury Fire Department was excited to get their new fire truck delivered to them today, but that didn't happen, and instead, they got something else. The fire department is getting $475,000 from Federal Emergency Management Agency to help offset the cost of a new ladder truck to replace their current 36-year-old truck, which recently failed certification. This grant comes after support was received from Senators Patrick Leahy, Bernie Sanders, and Congressman Peter Welch. They saw the need for the truck during the fire on Railroad Street this past December when several firefighters were forced to jump from an upper story window. In a joint statement, Leahy, Sanders, and Welch said, quote, The first firefighters who showed up on Railroad Street to fight this fire did so without a crucial tool in downtown firefighting, a ladder truck. When the chief told us the grant we were waiting to hear about could have, been prevent, could have prevented this life-threatening situation, the three of us knew that this was an increasingly urgent situation, end quote. The truck is currently in Maine and will be arriving within the next few days. The Vermont Fish and Wildlife Department is offering statewide grants to improve shooting ranges, which could either be ranges with guns or bows and arrows. So are local shooting range owners taking advantage of the possibility? News 7's Phil Alexander introduces us to Linwood Smith. So Linwood call. Smith is the owner of Smith's Archery in St. Johnsbury, which includes shooting ranges, both with guns and bows and arrows, that are eligible for improvement by a grant provided by Vermont Fish and Wildlife. That grant is worth up to $80,000, but Smith hasn't heard much about it. Well, really hadn't thought much about it, even though I'd like to do it, but... If Smith applies for the grant, he would have to provide 25% of the project funding and let the public shoot at his range for at least 20 hours per week. Right now, Smith teaches both archery classes and hunter safety classes. His archery range has been in operation since 1992, and he has eight shooting ranges in the woods in the back of his house. He feels that he could use some grant money, especially to improve his hunter safety classes. Probably like to have indoor shooting for rifles if that's possible. Also a bigger cl classroom probably so that we could, uh, when we do the hunter safety courses and stuff like that, that it would be bigger, just set up for that. With these improvements, Smith has plans to at least contact officials from Vermont Fish and Wildlife. I will, I will call them and ask them and see what the, everything, how it all works. It may fall into what I want to happen to this whole property. I want to be able to have it even after I'm gone, accessed by youngsters. Whether or not Smith gets any grant money, he plans to operate his ranges for as long as possible. Phil Alexander, News 7, St. Johnsbury. The deadline to apply for this grant is May 15th. A legislative debate started with a proposed delay on wind development in Vermont, but has been reduced to a review of how electric generation projects are cited. The original bill grew out of reaction to large-scale wind projects like the one in Sheffield. The new bill, which would involve a series of summer meetings among lawmakers on the subject, was voted on by the House's Natural Resources and Energy Committee. Governor Peter Shumlin appointed a commission to examine state policy on sitting and reviewing energy projects. The bill will now go before the full House. Vermont Governor Peter Shumlin and top federal judge Christina Reese 
will be welcoming 31 people from 19 countries as U.S. citizens. Their ceremony will be held at Essex High School. Reese will first administer the Oath of Allegiance, and then Shumlin and Reese will address the new citizens. The ceremony is supposed to bring awareness of the U.S. citizen process. This also gives the opportunity for U.S. citizenship and immigration services to attend the ceremony, which is typically the last step in the process. Employees usually only get to see the first few steps in the visa petition. And now Jeb Postel joins us with a first look at our forecast. Jeb, please correct me if I'm wrong, but I think spring is finally here. Well, spring is definitely in the air, and it is an awesome feeling out there. As right now, we have not much in the way of, actually, there's a few clouds across our area. But as you zoom out, again, the region is enjoying some nice weather today. But as you look towards our west, we have some more rain and clouds, and this will be associated with a cold front, as I'll explain later. So as we uh, go to the forecast for tonight, we're around 39 degrees with some scattered rain showers. And, by, and for tomorrow, again, we have some morning clouds, but there could be some breaks of sun in the afternoon with a high around 57 degrees. And for your headlines, we're going to have a brief cool down behind this front tomorrow. It will be a mostly dry weekend, and there will be a warm-up in temperatures. I'll have more on that. Back to you, Jess.